This is the second of three lectures on animal behavior. In the first lecture, we focused on the proximate approaches to studying behavior, and this is going to be the first one where we examine the ultimate approach to understanding behavior. And we're going to cover foraging, avoiding getting eaten or predation, habitat selection and use, and communication. Again, an ultimate approach is one in which you're trying to investigate the adaptive nature of a trait, in this case, behavior. So we want to understand how natural selection molds behaviors to lead to increased fitness. So how can animals make appropriate foraging behavior decisions? Uh, what's the best way to avoid predation? What are the appropriate ways to use habitat? And what's the most efficient form of communication to increase fitness? Let's first talk about finding food. Animals find food in a variety of ways using uh, different stimuli. Dung beetles uh, can pick up the volatiles associated with feces that they use uh, for food and for food for their young. European kestrels are uh, small falcons. They can see the UV spectrum of light as it's reflected from mice, urine, and feces trails, and so they use that to track down their prey. Bats. Uh, listen for things, so they can listen for frog vocalizations, they can listen for wing beats of uh, insects to find their prey. Now we're going to see that there's coevolutionary arms race between predators and prey, and prey oftentimes practice camouflage or cryptic behaviors to try to uh, prevent themselves from being seen by predators. And one of the counter adaptations that the predators have is to develop a search image. Search images increase your efficiency at finding cryptic prey. So in this picture here, we've got some of these uh, salt and pepper moths on a tree trunk that has different colors uh, or patches of, of light and dark. And here you can see one of the lighter ones uh, on, on one of the light parts of the tree. And as you focus on this species, if you were a predator, you'd get better and better about picking out these cryptic prey because you would start to develop this search image. There also would be a search image associated with the dark forms. Uh, here's a dark, the wing of, of one of the dark ones uh, on this branch scar. So developing these search images helps the predator to get more efficient at finding these cryptic or hidden prey. Now, if you're living in a group, there are some benefits uh, for living in a group as far as finding clumped and unpredictable food resources. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, but if I'm foraging in a group, there's going to be competition for that food. Well, this is going to be particularly uh, beneficial when the issue is finding the food, but when you find it, there's usually a lot of it, and so that really reduces the potential cost of competition. So think about a big, massive school of fish or a, a cloud of insects like termites and emerging from a, a mound. Where exactly those are going to be at any given day is hard to predict. And if you're working in a group, you can search a larger area and help to find that food resource. Well, when group living species live in colonies or uh, nest together in colonies, they can use that location as what we call an information center. And this is how it works. All of the individuals in a given morning will wake up and fly in different directions looking for food. Now some of the individuals will come back with food. Many individuals will come back without any food. But you see, the individuals that didn't find any food pay attention to those that came back with food. And so that when it's time to go back out again to find food, the unsuccessful individuals then follow the successful individual to the food patch. And on any given day, you might have been the lucky one to find the food initially, and so then you will be the leader to the unsuccessful individuals on that day, and on other days you might be the follower. So over many days, everybody can benefit from this uh, form of uh, sharing of communication. Groups can also be more efficient at capturing prey once they've found it. So pelicans and whales will coordinate their actions to force fish into tighter schools so that they can then uh, more efficiently capture these food items. 
Some predators like lions, wolves, and hyenas can work together to bring down much larger prey than they would be able to do on their own. All right, let's talk about this from a different perspective now. Instead of um, trying to be a more efficient predator, how do you avoid being a prey item to a predator? So the predators have evolved specific behaviors to increase finding, attacking, capturing, and successfully consuming prey. And prey have adaptations to counter these uh, behaviors of the predators. We call this a co-evolutionary arms race. The predators and the prey are trying to just stay one step ahead of the other in this evolutionary arms race. So as the prey become more cryptic, well, then the predators have to get better at developing a search image to find those. So we've already talked about this. One of the things you can do to avoid predation is just reduce your chance of being detected. So practice cryptic behavior. And that can be seen in many nesting birds where the eggs themselves are very cryptic and then when the young hatch, they also have a, a cryptic plumage. Here's an example of a cryptic lizard. You can see it in one environment. It tends to stand out, but uh, in a more natural environment where it normally would be found, it actually blends in quite well with the uh, leaf litter background. And this is the example we gave before of the salt and pepper moths. Again, one morphology is not necessarily better than the other just overall, but it's very context dependent. So in this habitat, it's better to be the light colored, and in this habitat, it's better to be the melanistic or the dark moths. And you can see they really do blend in well in the natural environment. And these moths will uh, actually adapt very specific behaviors, orientations, to kind of make sure that they are a better fit to, to blending in with the background. A lot of animals also will just reduce their activity to times when the predators are going to be less active. So kangaroo rats, gerbils, scorpions will forage more on moonless nights when owls are going to be less active. Okay, well there are other ways of avoiding predation. Let's say that you can't hide from the predator. The predator may find you. Are there other ways that you can dissuade them from attacking? So black-backed gulls and many other colonial nesting birds will mob potential predators, and mobbing is a behavior where they work together to attack the potential predator to try to drive it from the area. Here's an example of California ground squirrels doing the same thing to a snake. They uh, gang up on the snake um, and drive it from the area. In previous lectures, we talked about aposematic coloration. This is typically bright yellows, oranges, reds, and blacks, and contrasting patterns. And the potential prey species is indicating to a potential predator, hey, look, I'm poisonous, I'm distasteful, uh, I could hurt you somehow or at least make you sick. So this is seen in, in bees and wasps, ladybird beetles, monarch butterflies, and here you can see a blue jay, a naive blue jay, eating a monarch butterfly and then quickly uh, seeing that there's toxins associated with this and, and throwing up. And one of the things that we tend to see in species that show aposematic coloration is if you're in a low density, you might be the one individual to train, say, a blue jay that you're toxic. Well, that's not going to do anybody any good. But if you're living in a big group of individuals, some individuals will die, and obviously they're losing out in that. But uh, the other individuals of the species will benefit from that by um, living in denser aggregations. Now some species are not toxic or dangerous, but they may mimic a toxic or dangerous prey. So on the right here we have a bee, and on the left we have a fly that looks like a bee. It's called a bee fly. Viceroy butterflies are mimicking monarch butterflies. So they're, they're not really toxic, but they make a bird think twice about eating them if they've experienced uh, how bad monarchs are. Here's some ex other examples of mimicry. Here we have a caterpillar 
where the hind end is mimicking a vine snake. And gopher snakes and bull snakes will vibrate their tail like a rattlesnake to try to mimic uh, the scary rattlesnake rattle. And burrowing owls that live on the ground in, in burrows where rattlesnakes can be found at times will also mimic the sound of a rattlesnake to try to scare off a potential predator. Now other species that are not you know, toxic or dangerous in any way uh, will sometimes live near or in association with a protective species that is potentially dangerous. So this is a Lycaenid butterfly from Australia and they lay their eggs so the caterpillar can develop on plants covered in ants. And the ants feed off of uh, honeydews, secretions that the larvae produce, the caterpillars produce. And then the ants protect these caterpillars um, from potential predators. Rufous naped wrens nest near wasp nests. The wasps don't attack the birds, but they will attack any mammal like a raccoon or a quadimundi or a monkey that is trying to raid uh, the nest to get the eggs. So it provides some protection to the birds. The other thing you can do if you're a potential prey item is advertise unprofitability. Tell a predator, hey, I've spotted you. So if you know you you tend to be successful in attacking things by sneaking up. You, well you didn't sneak up, I've I've seen you. And so if they can signal to a predator that they've been spotted, that may cause the predator to call off the attack. Or if you can do something to demonstrate how healthy you are, some honest signal of your health, you're indicating to the predator, hey, look, if you attack, look how high I can jump. So just think how fast I am. You're not going to catch me. And so again, this is going to just deter the predator from attacking. One of the behaviors that fits this category of deterrence is stotting behavior, where something like a Thompson's gazelle will jump straight up in the air to indicate, look, I've spotted you, and look how high I can jump, and if I can jump this high, just think how fast I can run. Okay, well let's say that you haven't been able to hide, you haven't been able to convince them not to attack. How do you uh, prevent them from at least being successful in their attack, prevent capture? We talked about the uh, underwing moths that can, their first de defense is camouflage, but if that doesn't work, if something does get too close and it's gonna attack, they flash these hind wings that have the eye spots to attempt to startle the predator. Another tactic is to try to redirect the attack to a part of the body that if, if it is hit at least it won't be lethal. So here we have a, a lizard with a bright blue tail. This is a skink and if that draws the, the attention of the predator and it attacks the tail, the tail can come off and wiggle around to keep the attention of the predator while the lizard escapes. So it's, it's losing part of its body, but it's not likely to be killed. This is a hair streak butterfly, and hair streaks have the posterior end of their body accentuated with an eye spot and false antenna to again direct the attack to the posterior part of the body where an attack is less likely to be lethal. Some prey items, if they're attacked, will spray nasty chemicals. So this is a caterpillar that does this. This uh, structure right here will spray this uh, nasty chemical. And you can see it's uh, this snake here was coated in this chemical and actually glued the snake together. So it's a very effective deterrent. Walking sticks will also produce this kind of freon smelling chemical to deter a predator. Basically, it's, it's not a dangerous chemical, but it just smells really bad, and so it's a deterrent to the predator saying, if it smells this bad, just think how bad I would taste. Well, we talked about benefits of living in a group if you're trying to find food, but there are also benefits of being in a group if you don't want to be food. So if you're living in a group, there are more eyes looking out for predators. That means each individual has to do less scanning time and that means individuals can do more feeding time for uh, each individual. Because at any given time, somebody's going to be looking up in every direction, and you don't have to be scanning the entire horizon just by yourself. Another benefit of being in a group is what's called the dilution effect. This is safety in numbers. 
what it refers to is the bigger the group you're in, your lower individual probability of being killed by a predator. And that's shown by this figure here in a group of butterflies. As the group size increased, the probability that any individual would be captured greatly decreased. In small group sizes, if a predator attacks and kills somebody, well, it's more likely to be you. So you'd rather be in a group of 100 individuals than you have maybe one in 100 chance of being killed. But if you're in a group of four, well, you got 25% chance of being the individual killed. So that's the dilution effect. The bigger group, the better. Okay, and the last thing, if, if you are captured, is that it? Or is there something you can do to prevent consumption? Can you reduce the chance even after you've been captured? Well, a lot of animals will scream or release chemicals at that stage. And this could be, again, to startle the, the predator, to release you so you can escape. Or there's data to suggest in some cases what this is to do it's to signal to another potential predator to come and investigate. Then the two predators fight over you as a potential prey item, and while they're fighting, you escape. And this is, it has been demonstrated to work in some fish. I have a picture of a coyote here because one of the things that people that hunt coyotes do is they play a rabbit scream. A rabbit scream is a horrible sounding thing, but it's exactly what a rabbit sounds like when it's captured. And so that could be effective in drawing multiple coyotes to come fight over a rabbit uh, and give the rabbit at least some chance of escaping. Okay, the next topic I want to talk about is habitat selection. For virtually all species that are endangered or, or threatened species, the, the key issue associated with their endangerment is associated with habitat loss or habitat degradation. So understanding how animals use their habitat is really some of the most important information we can have to try to recover these populations and species. So this is a mixed colony of snowy plovers and, and least terns in a uh, sandy habitat. And these are two species that are highly endangered because of loss of this type of habitat. There are two basic habitat use patterns seen in animals. There's non-territorial use, as seen by these wildebeest here, where they're not defending any large patch of uh, territory or habitat. They're just using the food as they can find it. Sometimes this is also called just scramble competition. Other animals practice territoriality, where they defend this large area of habitat for their own exclusive use, or at least the exclusive use of their family. And so this red-winged blackbird here is signaling the boundaries of its territory and warning rival males to stay out. Some animals practice a behavior called migration, where they change the habitat that they use from a breeding season to a non-breeding season. Now most of you are familiar with that in birds, so an arctic tern will breed in the arctic, but it will then spend the winter time in the uh, southern hemisphere way down uh, off of the coast of Antarctica. Uh, when it's winter up here it's actually summer down there but then they'll make the return trip back up for breeding the next spring and summer. But migration isn't just restricted to birds, it's also seen in insects so mo monarch butterflies will migrate from North America going down to, into the uh, central Mexican highlands and this is a, a migration that uh, it occurs annually, but a single butterfly doesn't make the entire migration. They will lay eggs along the way, which will uh, hatch into caterpillars and pupate into other individual butterflies that will continue the migration. Other species that, that migrate, wildebeest, move uh, on the African savanna uh, pri primarily to search out for uh, water supplies. Whales will migrate from uh, rich feeding grounds for reproduction and, and getting enough food for reproduction up in the north, but then they'll migrate into tropical waters to give birth and to raise their young. Sea turtles uh, will 
also migrate from coastal Brazil to uh, isolated islands, again, that are predator-free to help increase reproductive success. And salmon, which spawn in freshwater, will migrate out and spend most of their life in the marine environment where there's easier foraging. Okay, the last topic we want to talk about today is communication. Communication is the transfer of information from a signaler to a receiver. I'll give you a, a really amazing example of communication in honeybees, uh, which are foraging and trying to indicate where they found resources to their nest mates. They'll do a two different types of dances to communicate where resources are found, a round dance and a waggle dance. Now, round dance is basically just what it says. They'll get into the hive and they'll just make these circles and this, these round circles where they're indicating to nest mates, say, hey, I found some food. It's really close. It's within 50 meters of the hive. Uh, just go. Just go out and find it. And during the dance, the workers are, are getting that signal, but they're also potentially getting some of the scent associated with the floral resource that was found that gives them another kind of clue of what they're looking for. But in cases where the resource that's been found is farther away, greater than 50 meters away, they do a different dance called the waggle dance. This is kind of a circle eight dance where they will walk in circles to oblong circles, but then they'll do this vibration dance here in the center. This is the waggle part of the dance. And the degree of the buzzing there indicates how far the resource is. If they vibrate really intensely, that means, hey, it's, it's pretty close. It's over 50 meters, but it's pretty close. If they vibrate a little bit, they're saying, well, I found some food. It's, it's way out there. Now, the other interesting thing about this, though, is it not only indicates distance, but it indicates direction. The number of degrees off of vertical indicates when the individuals leave the hive entrance the same degree to either the left or the right of where the sun is in the sky at that time. So it tells them now the direction to fly and the, the intensity of the waggle tells them how far to fly. So it's really a remarkable about, amount of information that the bees can give to each other to uh, find a food resource. We talked previously about the information center hypothesis. This is a great example of that. The, the honeybee hive is the information center where successful individuals are coming back and telling naive individuals where to find a food resource. So another, it's a benefit of living in a, a, a colony, in this case a hive. Communication is also important when individuals are in conflict with each other. Conflict doesn't always have to lead to physical fights. Even animals that have weapons oftentimes will use other means to communicate the likelihood of if we fought, who would win in this battle. And the benefit of this is uh, individuals don't necessarily have to waste the time and energy in fighting, and they also benefit by avoiding getting hurt. So if two bull elk are uh, potentially facing each other and trying to compete for the right to mate with females, a young small male may look at a big male and see him doing a display uh, that indicates how big he is, a roaring display and kind of this uh, dancing where they run alongside of each other. And the young male will say, yeah, this is just in my year. So I'm just going to just let him mate this year and I'm going to hopefully uh, be in a better position to mate next year. Okay, so that benefits both of these individuals to have this effective communication. It doesn't do the young individual any good to fight this year if it if has the potential to lead to his death uh, when he might have a much better shot in the next year. When you do see individuals fighting, that's usually because they're very equally matched and they're communicating, look, we're very equally matched. If we're going to settle this, the only thing we can do now is literally fight it out. Well, why doesn't an individual just bluff? Why don't you signal that, that you are the big, strong individual uh, and, and bluff your way into maybe a mating opportunity or to get some access to food? 
Well, the reason for this is it, it's not going to be stable in a long-term evolutionary sense. Eventually, somebody's going to call your bluff. And if it becomes clear that the signal that's being used isn't an honest signal, well, individuals are just going to start ignoring that. So honest signals evolve when they can uh, successfully indicate the true health and fighting abilities. Now what makes an honest signal an honest signal then is it has to be costly to produce and maintain. That's really the key to maintaining an honest signal. It can't be something that you can bluff. You can't fake how big you are or how loud you can roar if you're, say, a bull elk. Uh, small individuals just can't do it. That's an honest signal of an individual's size and health. So that's the key. The, sim the similar properties of all honest signal is they're expensive to produce and maintain. Another example of that is uh, prairie chickens. The males uh, produce these booming vocalizations and do these fancy dances. And the males that can do that for the longest period of time, the loudest and the most uh, consistent dances, are clearly the individuals in the best shape. You can't fake that. Now, a little bit in a future lecture, we're going to talk about how females will choose mates based on information uh, in exaggerated signals that are honest signals of males' quality. And we'll talk more about exactly why females are the choosy individuals later. But for in, in this example, we've already talked about painted buntings. Why are males so brightly colored? Well, these are costly traits to produce. And only healthy individuals can produce the, the brightest colorations, uh, avoid predation. So it, it serves as an honest signal of a male's quality to a female. But deception does occur particularly across species. So here's an example of a predatory firefly, two different species, one in the genus Photurus, the larger individual here, is actually eating a male of the genus Photinus. This female mimicked a Photinus female firefly to attract this male. He thinks he's found a mate, and as soon as he shows up, this bigger female eats him. So that she was signaling one thing, when she was really just trying to take advantage of this male and eat him. So we call her an illegitimate signaler. Similar thing is seen in uh, certain species of Australian spiders, where in this case the males will tap on the web of another species, mimicking that species courtship signal, and then when the female comes out to mate, uh, she's killed and eaten. There's another example of this with anglerfish, where they have these uh, extensions uh, near their mouth that they wiggle around as lures and they're, they basically are very still looking like a piece of coral. When a fish comes up to investigate that then they're eaten by the anglerfish. So why does this deception work? Since this is not a, an honest signal, why hasn't evolution gotten rid of this? In other words, why are individuals that are being deceived, why don't they learn to just ignore it? Well perhaps this is relatively recent. Maybe this is novel uh, deception. If that's the case, perhaps it is maladaptive to respond to this in, in the way where you get eaten and uh, this maladaptive response, the individuals that do that obviously are going to get filtered out by natural selection and so this trait will disappear in time. But in some cases it looks like these traits have been around for a long time and so maybe really what's going on here is individuals that are responding to these illegitimate signalers are in a catch-22. Typically, when you respond to uh, these types of signals, it's adaptive. So if you're a firefly flying around and you see a female ready to mate, well, that's how you can significantly increase your fitness. And if it's only rarely that that signal turns out to be coming from a illegitimate signaler, on average, it's better to respond. Typically, that's going to lead to high fitness. So in review, we first talked about how to find food using various cues, odor, sight, and sound. And so when we go through the different animal groups, we'll talk about the different sensory structures animals have for finding food. If you're going after cryptic prey, using a search image will help increase your search efficiency. And we talked about advantages of group foraging, such as the information center hypothesis. 
In other cases, you want to avoid being prey. You want to avoid predation. The first line of defense might be just to avoid an attack to begin with. You can do this with cryptic morphology and limited activity so that you're not seen by the predator. But this can actually come at a cost. Long periods of inactivity may limit your ability to eat and stay in good condition or find a mate. So we talked early, you know, surviving really isn't the most important thing from an evolutionary point of view. It's passing on copies of your genes. And so limiting your activity can become too costly at certain times. If a predator does see you, there are things that you could do to dissuade a predator from attacking. If you're in a group, you can work together to mob the potential predator to either kill the predator or drive it from the area. And again, this is more effective in group living or colonial animals. Other animals can dissuade a predator by advertising their dangerous or taste bad with aposomatic coloration. Other species may mimic dangerous animals or live in an association with a dangerous animal. Other animals may communicate to a potential predator that they've been spotted and advertise their unprofitability, advertise their health to, to try to dissuade the predator from attacking. Then there are things that you can do to prevent capture despite an attack. You can startle the predator, redirect the attack to a false head or the posterior part of your body with a, a moving brightly colored tail. You can spray the predator with chemicals, and there are benefits of living in groups from the perspective of avoiding predation. By having more eyes looking for a potential predator, you're more effective at preventing predator from getting too close. You can improve detection of that predator at a greater distance. And even if the predator does kill somebody in the group, if you're in a big group, you can benefit from the dilution effect. Now, synchronization can be very important in this situation. Uh, everybody active at the same time period so that, that you're all looking for individuals at the same time. And benefits may not really be the same for all individuals in the group. I kind of indicated, suggested that with the dilution effect. Say if you're in a group of 100, your chance of being killed is 1 in 100. Well, individuals on the outside oftentimes are, are of low, lower social status and they may be the individuals most likely to be attacked by a, a predator. They're still probably better off being in the group than being alone, but individuals in the center part of the group may actually be in the safest position. And then lastly, there's some things you can do to prevent consumption by screaming. You can startle the uh, predator so that they may release you, or you can attract a competing predator so that they'll fight and you can escape. Then we talk briefly about habitat use and the importance of understanding habitat selection and use in conservation biology. The two basic patterns of habitat use are territorial and non-territorial use. And we talked about how some animals are migratory, where they breed in certain habitats in certain parts of their life, times of their life, and then spend the rest of their life in the non-breeding season using different habitats. And understanding these migratory pathways is crucial, again, for conservation biology. The last thing we talked about was communication. Communication is defined as signals between a, a signaler and a receiver. We talked about the importance of signals in contest and mate choice being honest signals. And what keeps a trait an honest signal is it has to be costly to produce and maintain. And communication benefits both of the parties in potentially dangerous contests by preventing them from wasting time and, and the potential for injury, fighting over a resource. This is particularly true in social species. Effective communication helps to maintain stability within a group, allows for the uh, stable dominance hierarchies to exist. But deception does occur sometimes. Deceivers are called illegitimate signalers. This is a common predatory tactic. And why it persists, perhaps this has just evolved very recently, and the um, species that are falling for this, the individuals that do fall for it are going to get weeded out. Uh, individuals will learn to be more selective in, in not responding to these signals, and so the behavior will eventually disappear. Or it may be the case that there's a, a kind of a catch-22 and that typically individuals that, that are acting as receivers should pay attention to this signal. 
because they benefit typically from it. And, and only rarely will they, uh, if they respond to this, is there going to be a, a cost associated with it. And that may make these uh, types of behaviors persist.